I grew up in a society where in every single gathering, um, from the community gathering where the chief would head to public rallies to meetings, um, academic meetings where students were invited, and the message to young people was always, the youth are the leaders of tomorrow. Now, that sounds like a really well-meaning um, statement, except I think, unfortunately, it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy where the promise of youth is always tomorrow, never today. 42% of the world's population today is under the age of 25. That is 3.19 billion people are under the age of 25. Unfortunately, when you start to look at the parliamentarians in the world today, only 1.65% of them are in their 20s. Um, in a third of the world today, a third of the countries in the world, um, the eligibility limit for being a parliamentarian is 25 and older. As a result, we have an average age of members of parliament across the world at 53 years of age. Now, I know some of you might think, well, that is a really small part of society where the youth are underrepresented, but I think the story remains the same in the government workforce and in the private sector. The um, chart I have on the screen right now shows you the number of youth around the world who are looking for but are unable to find work. Um, the darker colors represent higher numbers, higher percentages. So if you're looking at like South Africa, you're talking about 35% and over of youth aged between 15 and 24 who want to work but cannot find a job. Um, the story is also the same if you're looking at the government workforce. A public service um, commission study that was done in Kenya last year indicated that the number of government employees who are aged between 19 and 35 accounted for only 13% of the government workforce. If you look at age 50 and over, that number was about 37%. So what this is telling us is whether we are talking about the democratic space, we are talking about the government workforce, or we are talking about um, the private sector, the youth are severely underrepresented. Now, um, this mismatch between the hopes and aspirations of the youth and the opportunities available for them um, presents a major risk in what we have been talking about as a benefit or potential benefits of the demographic dividend. What this means is whether the demographic dividend becomes an opportunity or a challenge in the world that we live in today depends on us as leaders and governments and what we can do today. So whether the youth um, are going to be involved in meaningful nation building activities or they're going to remain marginalized, frustrated, um, and become a risk to the national security and cohesion really depends on us. Now, the question for us today is what should we be doing? Um, and I would position that we have two key things that we have to do as individuals and government. And I think about these things as one, being able to prepare the youth so that they have, they're able to take advantage of the opportunities that will be availed to them. And two, there are things as government that we have to put in place so that when we prepare the youth, then they're ready to come into something that we have prepared. And the rest of my talk today is going to mainly focus on those two, um, those two efforts. So when I think about preparing the youth, it's really about ensuring that when we put them into positions of leadership, positions where they can contribute to society, then they have the necessary skills and competences for them to be able to contribute. What do we mean by skills and competences? I think we position this as mostly things that should happen in, in the education system, but I think this is where government has to play a role a, in the curriculum, but also in thinking about what are the things our youth are going to require to be successful in the workplace, to be successful as contributors in government, and to be successful as leaders. So um, an example of something that we are doing in Kenya in this space 
um, the government of Kenya set up a presidential digital talent program which allows um, or invites um, students who are graduating from college with um, computer and technology skills but do not have a job. They get admitted to work in government and they are placed in multiple um, agencies. And as they start to get some work experience, then we in the private sector start to partner with government to provide them additional skills and competencies that ensure that they will be successful once they finish this program. Uh, why is this a key, um, a program that I think would be so beneficial in many aspects of our lives? Um, it's a win-win situation for both government, private sector, and our society as a whole. One, it allows the students who are graduating to get work experience. Most jobs today will look for people who have work experience, and if you're graduating, have no work experience, it's impossible to get a job. So they, first of all, get a job where they can um, use that on their CV as work experience. Um, the second component is government is able to get people who can work, um, both in government agencies, but then for private sector, uh, this creates a pipeline of potential employees who have work experience and who have technical skills from companies like um, IBM training them and other multinationals. Now, this is only in the, um, in the technology space in Kenya. I think we have to ask ourselves, how do we scale this up so that we have similar projects or programs for technology, for medicine, for um, marketing, and all the other different fields that we're going to need in society. So, um, and this is where we can really think about how technology can help us to be able to scale such platforms so that you have both the supply and demand side available to be able to train students who are coming out of school and have no um, work experience or the necessary skills to really perform well in the, in the jobs that they have. Um, once uh, we look at being able to train and develop the right competencies for individuals or young people who are coming out of the education system, the next part is being able to ask, how do we bring them to the table so that they can become meaningful contributors? I think about this as mainstreaming the youth. In other words, giving them a seat at the table, not just deciding at the table and then giving them the benefits that we decide. And I think about this as things that we have to do in three main areas in society. So one is about mainstreaming the youth in the government sector uh, as government workforce. The second part is mainstreaming the youth in civic engagement. And the last part is in mainstreaming the youth so that they become meaningful contributors in, the, in nation building, in other words, in the private sector. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about the first two um, areas, and then the rest of my talk will really focus on how we get the youth to become meaningful contributors in the private sector and the work that we have done in that regard. So. Um, when we think about youth in the government workforce, as I mentioned before, there's very few young people who are working in government today. So the question I think is to, for us as um, government and leaders is to think about the youth and the entire value chain of how we attract um, the youth into going into fields of education that have to do with policy and governance how we attract them into the workforce, how we retain, how we train them, and how we make sure that they're set up for success. Um, the second thing that we need to think about very clearly and have clear strategies for is how, understanding how the youth engage today. So they live in the most technologically connected world than we have ever done. And so the workplace that we provide for them in government has to reflect those realities so that we can give them an environment to come up with ideas that will serve their peers. Uh, when we think about civil engagement, I think it's about creating policies and programs that will educate our youth from a very young age to become mindful of the societies they live in and to start to contribute. So when we talk about civic engagement, I think it starts from the community level all the way to um, a national level. Now, as I said, uh, the last and remaining part of my conversation is going to be based on what we can do to ensure that majority of youth will be meaningful contributors in nation building. Um, the government's main role, um, and I believe government plays a critical role in this, is in the creation of an enabling environment 
where businesses can set up and thrive. And this has been the focus of my work at IBM Research Africa. The government of Kenya came to us and wanted to improve the business environment for both entrepreneurs and foreign investors so that they could be able to set up and run their businesses efficiently and so that they could contribute to creation of jobs. Statistics tell us today that four out of five new jobs that are being created in emerging markets are being created by small and medium-sized enterprises. So to the, ex the extent to which governments can be very clear about removing any barriers that these small businesses have in accessing government services, in running and operating their businesses, then they're contributing directly to how we can um, create jobs that the youth um, really need. So the work that we have done in Kenya, um, we were asked by the president to think about what the specific items we should target for reform towards improving the business environment. When we started our work in Kenya about three and a half years ago, Kenya was ranked 136 out of 189 countries in this World Bank Ease of Doing Business ranking. This ranking looks at how easy or difficult it is to set up a business and to run a business in a country. So four years ago, we were, tag, uh, were ranked at 136. Uh, the president of Kenya set a very ambitious goal for us to be ranked 50 by year 2020. So when we got asked to do this work, we started by understanding what really this ranking was measuring and to understand the situation that Kenya was in. Just to give you a brief background about the ranking, it looks at 10 different indicators and the measurement is really to get to understand how difficult, and difficulty here means complexity in terms of how many different interactions do you need to have with government, uh, how long does it take for you to accomplish a particular process, how much it costs, and lastly, if the kinds of processes that have been put in place are effective in ensuring that maybe government da um, citizens' data is kept safely and also that it meets the best practices across the country. So some of the indicators that are measured um, are, for example, starting a business. So how much time does it take to start a business? How much time does it take to transfer property? Does, how much does it cost, et cetera? When we started this work in Kenya, um, the situation was not very good. So some examples would be that starting a business in Kenya about three years ago took about 30 days, 11 different interactions with the government, um, and cost about 35% of what our per capita income would be. Uh, in the best countries, registering a business was basically a one-hour event that you could access from anywhere in, the, um, anywhere in the world, really, so long as you had a computer and some internet. So we set out to improve what we wanted, um, where Kenya was, so that we could get to best practice. How did we do this? Uh, we started by, A, understanding what the legal infrastructure or the regulatory framework said about um, what was required to start a business. We then went ahead to really collect a lot of data to understand where the bottlenecks were in registering a company. We were able to review and create a new system that would allow us to be able to register companies in a much shorter time and then be able to implement that system not just as a manual process, but as an online system that was now accessible to um, individuals across the country. We did this not just in that one indicator, but in all of the 10 that are measured by the World Bank. So registering property, getting credit, um, trading across borders, paying taxes, all of these different areas, the goal was to see where we are today and how we make significant improvements so that businesses are able to focus on the key things and only spend a very small amount of their time complying to what government required them to do. What have we been able to achieve so far? Uh, we've been able to make very significant improvements. So for example, for starting a business, we've changed the procedure from number of procedures from 11 to three, and now companies are able to register in just about a day or two. Our goal is for us to get to the best practice, which is being able to register your company in just um, a few hours and from the comfort of your home anywhere. Now, as for the ranking, today, based on all the other improvements we have made to the 10 indicators, we're happy to report that our ranking has improved from 136 out of 189 countries to get to 80, which was announced last year, 
And our goal is really to get to top 50 so that we can be able to compete meaningfully in the world. What does that mean for entrepreneurs today? It means that entrepreneurs do not have to travel from far-flung um, parts of the country to come to the city so that they can be able to access government services. For as long as they have internet, then they can access these services directly. Um, and now, as we start to create systems for recording data that are online, for engaging with citizens, then at IBM we can also start to think about how we use that data to drive much more intelligent decision making using tools such as artificial intelligence that are at, are at our fingertips. Um, from a government perspective, what that means is businesses can now focus on what they are best at doing, creating new jobs that are going to assist um, the economy to grow. As a government, and um, as a parting shot for all of us, I hope that we can start to think about the success of our youth in the way that they engage, in the way that they contribute in the society as a measure for what our progress as a society is. Thank you, and I appreciate your attention.